Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Father, we just come before you this morning. My God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, my God, for the caution and the warning that you send forth, and that you're saying to us, O oh God, this morning, don't look back and don't turn back. I pray, O oh God, this morning for your sons and daughters who may find themselves in the valley of decision, my God, leaning towards you, but somehow the enemy, the world has convinced them, my God, to continue on a path, my God, that will continue to, my God, just reveal to them heartache, pain, and misery, my God. But we come this morning knowing that you're a God who can meet us where we are. God, you can send divine instruction. You can send your divine word, my God, that will meet us and to counter where we are, what we're dealing with, what we're wrestling with. And so we just pause this morning. God, we're just asking you to go before. Go before this morning. Go before, go before, go before. Ah, God, the praise and worship, my God, you instructed it in the Old Testament. The praises will go before your word. And that's what we have done. Your praise has gone forth. And we know that your praise, O oh God, is going to reach and it's going to get to the heart of your sons and your daughters. Your praise and your worship, my God, cause you to inhabit our praise. You inhabit in that you come and you see about us. You, my God, tabernacle with us. You spend time with us. And that's what we're asking you to, this, to do this morning. Why? Because what you have given me, it's important, my God, for your sons and your daughters to hear. And we are praying and asking. We bind the plan of the enemy. God, the plan of the enemy where he wants to come and to disrupt and to prevent and to stop. We bind it in the name of Jesus. And we're asking you this morning, my God, go before us like do in the morning. Gently rest, my God, on this service this morning. Have your way. Have your way this morning. Have your way. God, as we wait on you. God, we're not in a hurry. And if it is that we pray and wait on you, my God, that is what we're going to do. We're lying, oh God, with what the scripture says in that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagle. They will run and not be weary. The songwriter goes on and he says, teach me, Lord, how to wait. We wait on your presence this morning, God. We don't want to go ahead of you this morning. We don't want to go ahead of you, but God, we wait on you this morning. We wait. We wait and we say, have your way this morning. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. While we wait, we're going to turn my God, to the book of Luke, chapter number 16. That's where our assignment is, and we're going to begin at verse 19. Have your way this morning, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way this morning. Have your way this morning. Have your way. Have your way this morning, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My God, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is the most high, the righteous run in, and they are saved this morning. Our conversation is centered around validated by the validated at the judgment seat of Christ. Who are you? Validated at the judgment seat of Christ. Who are you? We will understand as we, my God, begin to read. Luke chapter number 16, we'll start at verse 19. We have a lot of reading to do. The Lord has a lot to say, and I'm going to get out the way. So Luke chapter number 16, my God, we start at 19, and it reads thus, it says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So this man was rich. The color purple was a sign of wealth in biblical days. And he is a parallel <laughs> that he wore something similar to what I have on. This is maroon, but his was purple. And the Bible goes on in 20 and it says, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, my God, full of sores and laid at his gate. So we have a contrasting picture here in that one is rich and wealthy, and you have another one that is poor, and my God, his entire body is covered in sore. Talk about validated, my God, at the judgment seat of Christ, my God. 
who are you? Who are you? Verse 21, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, more heavy, the dogs came and licked his sore. So that's the way in which he got comforted because his body began to break down. And there was a rich man that was looking at this poor man and he would pass him. And the Bible said that he had a desire. My God, even the crumb, I will take the crumb that fall from the table. Watch it, 22. It says, so it was, my God, that the beggar died and was carried away, my God, by an angel to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. And notice, if you will, it states here, mom, that the rich man was buried. So both died. One was carried away, my God, to the bosom of the Lord, but one was buried. One was carried away, one was buried. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you see, you have to live a life that is pleasing to God in order for you to experience that. And if you don't, then you are going to be buried. Can I take my time this morning? The Bible said that one was carried away and the other was buried. Watch this 23. And being tormented, in Hades, this is the rich man, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Good God. So you live a life that is pleasing to God, there is the reward that you will experience. But if you live a life that is not pleasing to God, living according to your own standards and your own righteousness. You see, I talked about this last week. You see, everybody, my God, will get an experience to sit at the judgment seat of Christ. The question is, what happens after he deliberate over the life that you live? Can I take my time this week? And being tormented in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Watch this. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send my God, send Lazarus, that he may dip my God the finger, dip his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am tormented in flame. So when you live, my God robed in flesh, you had it in abundance. Now you die, you're on the other side uh, and you look at the outcomes of your actions and your decision that you made in this life. You see, Lazarus is comforted, good God, because of the life that he lived. Yes, he may have gone through difficult times, and difficult season, but now you look, and when you look, you see Lazarus, you recognize him, you know this. So note this, if you will, after death, they are conscious, good God, of where they are. Hey, my God, they are conscious. Both of them are conscious. They're conscious. They know where they are. But Abraham said unto him, son, remember, my God, that in your lifetime, you receive good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. My God, and you are tormented. Be careful of the choices you make. I just want to stop this morning and interject right there. This is why the Lord is saying to us, don't turn back and don't look back. Luke 19, 62, no man that put his hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom of God. I don't care what it is, what you're dealing with, what you're wrestling my God, with this morning, the instruction for you, my God, is to don't look back and don't turn back. Don't become distracted. 26. And besides this, between, watch this, watch this, besides this, so he's asking to be comforted and look at what, my God, the word of God says now. And besides this, my God, between us and you, there is a great gulf that is fixed. Watch this. So that, so that those who want to pass from where you are cannot, my God, nor can these come and pass to us. So there is a distinct separation. The Bible speaks of this gulf that is fixed. And when Abraham stood up with Lazarus and look, he can see, my God, Dives being tormented. And the desire, my God, that he has is that I want to go on the other side. But I came to say to somebody this morning, don't let my God too late be your cry this morning. You have an opportunity for your actions, your attitudes, and your behavior to be validated by the presence of the Lord so you can turn and change 
my God, and you will be, you will have an opportunity to be on the right side of history, if you will. So the gulf is fixed, and the gulf is of such that I can see you, you can see me. But my God, God fixed it in such a way, my God, that there is no way you can go from that side to this side. And when he realized, my God, that this was the reality that he has to navigate, watch 27. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send, my God, him to my father's house. I have five brothers, my God, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to my God, this place of torment. And the question that you have to ponder in your mind, is there a prevailing thought, idea, ideology, or ideal, my God, that uh, is taught in this household? And because he know, knew the reality or the end result, the scripture says to us that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. So no, he realized the error of his ways. My God, and he's trying to be, if you will, an evangelist from the grave. And he said to him, watch the response to the word. There is no repentance in the grave. The life that you live does matter. And you have two choices. You either live and you serve God, good God, or you live, my God, and you are anti-God and you curse God and you die. But he said to him, I beg thee, therefore, that thou would send him to my father's house. Why? My concern is that I have five brothers, my God, that are there, clothed in the same mindset, and if nothing happens, and if they do not change, they're going to end up in the same place, and I don't want this for my family. 20, my God, eight again, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them that lest, my God, they come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, they have Moses, and they have the prophet. Let them hear. They have Moses, and they have the prophet. I did not, my God, leave them without the opportunity to hear the word of God. And if the word of God is being preached and teached, they have an opportunity ah, to say yes, but they have to make a choice. You see, I can live this life. And I can live it based on my godly conviction, or I can live it based on my compromise. And I do say this to you this morning, live according to your godly conviction. And it says now, and Abraham said, no. Fa and he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes from the dead, they will repent. I wonder if this was a thought, a prevailing thought my God, that was discussed in their homes. And my God, you notice the words that he is saying. Notice it's an indication, my God, of things, my God, that reside in their heart. If someone go from the grave, tell them they will repent. But he said to him, if they will not hear Moses and the prophet, Mando Bosha. Neither will they be, my God, persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Spirit of the living God. Ah. Spirit of the living God. We come before you this morning. God, and we pause in this moment. Father, if we were to be weighed in the balance this morning, what would we be found guilty of or found wanting according to Daniel chapter number 5 and 22? If you were to weigh us this morning, weigh us, weigh us, just put us in the balance and weigh us in the balance. What, my God, revelation might we receive as it relates to our walk and our relationship with you? Is it to where we would receive, my God, validation to say yes, you are on the straight and narrow path. Keep doing what you're doing. Or would it be of such, my God, we are rich when it's all said and done? The scale will reveal we are living in and with a form of godliness denying the power of the Lord. We come before you this morning. 
And we're asking you this morning, Lord God, have your way this morning. Have your way. Have your way this morning, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way. God, we look to you this morning. My God, we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Validated by the Spirit of God. Who are you? Who are you? Validated by the Spirit of Almighty God. Who are you? That's the question that the Lord has been asking us. And now he takes us into this story, one that may or may not be familiar to us. This is the story about two men, two choices that they have. One decide that they're going to serve the Lord and their circumstance is not dictating how they serve God or why they serve God. And the other had just about everything. And because he had everything, God was not front and center for him. God was an afterthought. And because the Lord was an afterthought and was not a priority to him, we know how it is when things are not a priority to us. We interact with it every now and again, maybe once in a blue moon, as we rightfully state. But the Lord is bringing the awareness to us this morning. And he's asking us the question, can I just preach I, the way I feel led of the Lord this morning? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm a preach uh, how I feel led of the Lord validated. Not sure if you ever had the opportunity to uh, maybe go to a hospital and you have a family that is staying there and you have to pay for parking and they give you this ticket. And if you go down to the attendant, you can get the ticket validated. And when the ticket is validated, the price that you uh, would have not would have uh, paid had the ticket not been validated, it is at a lesser rate. So the validation, it's important. And I want to ask you the question this morning, along this Christian pathway that you're living, my God, has the Lord ever validated, my God, that you're on the right? Have you ever checked in with him, had a conversation for him to validate? Yes, you're on the right path. You're doing good. You're, no, no, we, we're, we're not going to do that. Yeah, we're not, no, 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 we're going to get that out. Have you ever just checked in with the Lord, my God, for him to validate where you are in your walk? And if you're not, it's a good thing. Fasting and prayer, my God, is one way in which we check in and we get validated. I take my time this morning. We just read, my God, Luke chapter number 16 from 19 to 31. One of the things that we do here is we ask ourselves some question. What do we know from the text that we have read? The Bible informed that there are two men. We know their name. We know their status in society, uh, the opportunity, my God, that afforded both of them before they died, my God, and the choice that they made, my God, when they were. So we know their name, we know their status in society, and we know the opportunity that afforded them, and we know of the choices, excuse me, that they made before they died. We know the order, my God, of their death. And what happens after? The Bible said that the beggar died, which was Lazarus. And he was taken, my God, into Abraham's bosom. My God. The Abraham's bosom, rather. The Bible also said that the rich man died. But he ended up, my God, in a place of torment, my God, for the rest of his days. The text speaks of this great divide or the gulf that is fixed. This distinct separation rewarded Lazarus and Dives based on the choice that they made in this life. We know that Lazarus being poor was not sent, my God. We know that Lazarus being poor was not an excuse for him not to trust and to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. We know the rich man Lazarus, the rich man Dives rather, he overlooked John 14 and 16 in that it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You can't get there without a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't get there. There is no way that your riches can, uh, can, can, can buy your way into heaven. It is a relationship. Everybody's heart, my God, 
has to be evaluated in and with the spirit and the presence of Almighty God. I'm taking my time. Lazarus, again, we know that he made a choice. And like Job going through his difficult time, Lazarus would have said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. My God, you see, this is what the Lord is looking for in us to validate. Yes, that is my son. And yes, that is my daughter. So my circumstances do not dictate or determine if or when I trust and I serve God. My circumstances independent of that. In fact, the scripture says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It has nothing to do with my zip code, my area code, or where I'm coming from. It has to do with a heart that is penitent and surrender to the things of God. And again, circumstances do not dictate and determine my worship that I give unto God. I worship him because he's God. And if he never does anything for me, I'm still going to worship him. Now, note verse 32. It says, Lazarus died and was carried away, transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Again, I reference this to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The rich man was buried. The rich man, again, he was buried. Said that again for somebody. The rich man was buried. You only bury that which is dead. Anyone, my God, that you bury, my God, does not know the Lord as their personal Savior will remain on that side of the gulf. But when you live a life that is pleasing to God, you will be on the other side of the gulf looking, my God, and your choices to serve God in spirit and truth will be validated. Notice the conscious reality after both Lazarus and Dives died. Lazarus was now rested in Abraham's bosom, but Dives was tormented. Let me say this to someone this morning. My God, there is rest beyond the grave. If you serve God in spirit and truth and there is torment and restlessness for you to gain, my God, based on the choice you make while you are alive. Ah, food for thought. Yeah. Mm. Food for thought, man. In this world that we live, Man has an answer for everything, and man can explain everything with the exception of what happens when the soul is separated from the body. Man, God gives man the understanding and the intellect to look at things and explain how things happen. But no man can explain what happened when the soul is separated from the body. Notice Lazarus's request. I live according to what I was taught. And I've got five brothers who is living the same way. But it's not until I get to this side, after I died, I now realize because he's conscious of where he is. He's conscious of where he is. And he realized the error of his ways after he dies. But there is no opportunity for him or anyone to go back and to my God, plea and present his case. Because understand this, if the opportunity presented itself where he could have left from this side of the gulf and go and to speak to his brother, he would have, my God, the influence that he had and he would have shared with his brothers, his brothers, chances are, we're just going to say chances are because we do not know, but because he went to the other side, he is now coming with information to share and to say we need to change, we need to break up our folly ground and we need to turn because if we don't, what we have been taught in this life, it is going to lead to destruction. Maybe they would have questioned and asked him, why would he say that? And he would have said, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end are the ways of death. 
all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. Do not, do not continue on the same pathway. Turn because there is an eternity for you to gain and there is a hell for you to lose, but the choice is yours. Hmm. Hmm. Do not turn back. Do not look back. Validated by the Spirit, presence of God. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Have you ever heard the expression or the term, I'm a good person? or he's a good person, or she's a good person. The question that I have, or I want to ask now, it's simply this. <laughs> number one is to define good. And then number two, by whose standard, my God, are you using to define and to say <laughs> that person is good? I remember someone came up to Jesus as a good Lord. And he said, why do you call me good? And it's not to say that he was not. But you see, he's trying to understand what standards, my God, are you using to come to that determination? Maybe you yourself have said, I'm a good person. And then my question again is, what standard, my God, do you use to come up with that determination? Is it the world standard, my God, or is it the standard of God? Because again, chances are, if you're looking at the text through the lens of the world, and you ask yourself the and you ask the question, which one of these two men are good? Chances are, we would conclude that Dives was the one, my God, that was good. And again, you have to look at the standards. You have to look at the, the factors. You have to look, my God, at the variables that you use to come up with that determination. Because you see, good, based on the world standard, my God is not going to get you in heaven. But good, based on the standard, my God, that the Lord has established. You see, this is what's going to get you to spend, my God, eternity with the Lord. Can I preach like I feel it this morning? You see, what comes to my mind, my God, is a story in the book, my God, of Genesis. Can I take my time this morning? Talking about the standards that we use, my God, to, to weigh and to determine, my God, who is good and what is good and how we determine, my God, what is good. My God, the book, the story that comes to mind is the story where God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Can I just take my time this morning? God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is the, my God, the story, my God, in Genesis chapter number 19, spills over into 20. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they're living a life, my God, that is just uh, displeasing to the Lord. And he said, that's it. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah came up, my God, before the Lord. And the Lord had a conversation with Abraham. And he said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Get your family and I want you to leave. And Abraham protested, my God, what God wanted to do in that Abraham said, God, what if you find 50 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah? Would you destroy the good with the wicked? And the Lord says, I won't. But he then said to him, here is my standard, and I want you to go. And if you, Abraham, can find 50 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not destroy the city. I will save it for 50 righteous. Abraham took what God gave him and he went about into Sodom and Gomorrah and he's looking and is conf it, my God. He's looking and his suspicion could not be confirmed based on the standard that God gave him. And he came back to God again and said, well, I, uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, and, and, and he said, what if we find 40? What if we find 40? 
Because again, you see, Abraham went and Abraham was looking, but what Abraham saw was a form of godliness. And because he saw a form of godliness, he thought that God would have compromised with that. And God says, again, it's the same. My standard, they do not change. What is my standard? Looking at men and women who are obeying my godly conviction that they experience. And God says, go. And when Abraham went looking to see if he can find 40 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, he came back again. But God, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> What if we find 30? Because again, what Abraham had in mind, and when he took that and he measured it against what was out there, Abraham realized that, my God, I really thought this, but it's not. Abraham went, there was not 30. Abraham went, there was not. My God, 20. Abraham went and could not find 10. Could not find 10. Based on the established standard. Yes, there were men and women in Sodom and Gomorrah stating that, yes, I am a good person, but good according to whose or what standard? Good according to, my God, your cultural orientation or good according to, my God, the, the clear word of God? Whose standards are you living by? When we get to Ezekiel, chapter number 22, and when we get to about verse 30, again, in Ezekiel chapter number 22 and 30, it says the prophets have done wrong, the priests have done wrong, and I'm looking for a man to stand in the gap, to make up the edge, but I found none. So we see this is not the first time that God has given his established standard and to say, go see if you find men and women that are living according to these standards because they are the sons and the daughters of God. And when Ezekiel looked, he said, I could not find none because again, God was trying to save and he was trying to preserve. Living according to the standard of God. Whose standards are you living by? Whose standards? Whose standards are you living by? The world standard or the standard of the word of God? Are you living as wolf in sheep clothing, St. Matthew chapter number five, seven and 15? Or are you living, my God, as Jesus was put it when he confronted the Pharisees, are you living as a whitewashed sepulcher? Beautiful on the outside, but wicked, vicious, and conflicted on the inside. But yet, these are the individuals that presented themselves and say, I am a good person. Good by whose standard? You see, the world that we live in has taught us, mom, to live as a cheap copy of a great original. And anything that is genuine and authentic, it is attacked, discredited, and discouraged. Can I say that again? The world that we live in has taught us to live as a cheap copy of a great original. And anything, my God, that is genuine and authentic, it is attacked, it is discredited, and it is discouraged. The world, my God, has taught us and they even made movies out of this that all dogs, they do go to heaven. And my God, in fact, it does not matter the life that you live. We will all end up in the same place. But I came this morning to tell somebody, my God, that there is a heaven to win and there is a hell to lose. And not everybody get to spend eternity with God. It has to do with the life that you live. So you don't get to cop out and to live and to do what you want to do just like Dives because you were rich and then you are going to think that you are going to end up in heaven. One of the hardest things I have to do is when I do a funeral and persons who knew the person who was not living any kind of life that is not pleasing to God come and they ask me, Pastor, are they going to go to heaven? My answer, my God, is no. 
If they did not live a life that was pleasing to God, it would be wrong for me to stand here and to say to you, you're going to see them in heaven. I don't get to judge and I don't get to determine. But my question to you is, did they live a life that was pleasing and surrender to God? And if the answer to that is no, then I'm going to say to you, you are not going to see them in eternity. I can't with all good conscience say to you that that person did not live and you expect me to stand on a pulpit and to say to you that that person who, my God, cursed God every single day of their life is going to spend eternity with him. Why would God drag you into eternity when you want nothing to do with him in this life? When, my God, he has given you his word and every opportunity, my God, if eternity is what you want and you desire and you expect to spend with him, you are every opportunity to align yourself with him, my God, and to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into a relationship, break up your fallen grounds and change from your wicked ways and walk after the precepts and the principle of scripture. Know that you are dead. You are going to be buried. And there is no repentance in the grave. None. So if I decide that my God I want to spend eternity, my God, with my heavenly father. You have ample opportunity and choice, my God, to turn from your wicked ways. Whose standards, my God, are you living by? The world has taught us again that all dogs go to heaven and they don't. And we, my God, have, ah, we have just gobbled that up and we're going with what the world has said to us. But again, the world has an answer for everything. The world is yet to tell you what happened when the soul of man gets separated from his body. We have scripture helping us to understand that this is a conscious reality afterwards and there is a gulf that is fixed and there is one out of two places that you go. You either spend eternity with God or you spend, my God, the rest of your days being tormented in hell and there is no if ands are bought about it, that is just the reality. And again, it is your choice. But just like Dives, my God, too late might be your cry because you're going to end up in a place where you have a conscious reality looking and going, oh God, that's Pastor Ian, that's Monica, that's Alison, that's Rick. Oh, but that, that, yes. And it's going to be too late. The world we live in. It has diluted, polluted, eroded, gutted, and confused us, my God, leaving us numb and unresponsive to the truth of the gospel being preached. The world, my God, has taught us to be contentious, combative, divisive, my God, and emboldened to shake our fist in the face of God with no respect or regards for our action, my God, failing to comprehend, my God, that what the scriptures say is true in Proverbs 14 and 12, that there is a way that seemeth right, it looks right, it feels good in the moment. But again, who have you asked? Have you asked the Lord to validate, my God, where does this lead? Man. The world, again, that we live in, a coined phrases like, yes, I am a good person. This is my truth. No one can judge me. I don't need a shepherd. But Romans 10 and 14, my God, states, my God, the following question. How then, my God, can they call on me in whom they do not believe? How? How? And how shall they believe in him whom, my God, they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? Maybe this is what my God, Dives, remember. Maybe he passed a church and maybe Dives hear this scripture being recorded. And maybe this is what Dives was now saying. Please send somebody to talk to my, my, my five brothers because I don't want them to end up where, ah, oh my God, I am at this point. I don't want them to end up here. But the scripture is correct in that it says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit saith to the church. Ah. How can they hear without a preacher? 
You see, being poor is not an indictment on your future. In fact, St. Matthew chapter number 5 and 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because there is the kingdom of heaven. And I say, my God, as my God, excuse me, blessed are the poor in spirit, but there is the kingdom of heaven. As I say, my God, uh, as I say, we are going to hell because we refuse, am I saying rather, excuse me, am I saying we're going to hell because we refuse to accommodate the poor? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to us, my God, that God has created opportunities for us to put on display his love. And when we become selective, my God, in what we do and how we do it, we are misrepresenting the gospel and we are misrepresenting Christ. Can I take my time this morning? Well, let's go to St. Matthew chapter number 25. Let's go to St. Matthew chapter number 25. And as we're going to Matthew 25, we're going to pick up verse 31. The question that I want to ask you is simply this. Are you the same person when the camera is on or when the camera is off? Or do you change and do you modify yourself, your expressions and what you do? Are you consistent in who you are as a child of God? St. Matthew chapter number 25. Let's start at 31. And it says now, the Son of Man come in his glory. And all my God, the holy angels with him. Then my God, he will sit, my God, on the throne of glory. And all the nations, my God, will be gathered before him, my God. And he will separate, my God, them one from another as a shepherd divide the sheep and the goat. So there is a distinct separation when, when my God, we sit at the judgment seat of Christ. We are either going to hear, enter into my rest or depart from me, I know you not. And what my God will make the difference is the choice that you make in this life. <clears throat> Watch this. 33, he said, and he will set up the sheep on his right hand and the goat on his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, my God, you... Bless of my father, inherit my God, the kingdom prepared for you and the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, my God, and you gave me food. Talk about what we do when we see the poor. Am I the same when the camera is on or am I a different individual? Do I modify and change my expression or am I validated by God regardless of who is looking? The question was asked, when did I see you and did not do for you, God? And no, he's answering. The king shall say, my God, to those on his right hand, come, my God, and be blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me and I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me in prison. My God, and when you came to me, ah, watch this, then the righteous, my God, will I answer and say unto him. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to this in a minute. Then the righteous will answer. So again, we have a righteousness that we, my God, have coined. It's a standard that is not established by God, but I'm going to talk about this where Paul talks about our righteousness being as filthy rock. Let me read this and then I'll get to that. Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, did we not, my God, see, when did we rather see you hungry, my God, and feed you our thirst and give you to drink. Watch this. When did we, when did we see you, my God, a stranger, my God, and take you in naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? My God, and the king will answer and said, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you do, my God, for the least of these, my brethren, you did to me, my God, then will you also, uh, uh, then will you also say to those on the left hand, depart from me. Uh, why? Because you are cursed into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angel. For I was hungry, my God, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything. I was a stranger, my God, and you did not do anything for me. And the story continues. Lazarus and Dives. Lazarus has everything. My Dives rather has everything everything that his heart desired. And D Dives was, Lazarus rather, was the one that was sitting there. Uh, he was poor and he was hungry. But we dare look at, my God, the Dives of this world, and we say that they were a good person. How can I be a good person when I'm selective in my response to another child of God? 
power. Because you see, the righteous, they come and they think because of what they do when the cameras are on. And that moment is now captured and embedded in time forever. And they can look in that and feel good about themselves. Notice, if you will, in the text that we read in Luke chapter number 16, it says that Divi Lazarus was on the outside of the rich man's house, desiring just for the very crumb that fall from his table. If I can just get the crumb, I would be okay. If I can get the crumb that fall. And you're telling me that we dare look at this and we say that this was a good man. Again, my question is according to whose standard. Define good for me. Good according to what or who? Because again, Jesus is confronting the same nonsense in scripture in that they call themselves good. And they talk about their righteousness. But Paul puts it to us this way. That your righteousness and mine is as filthy rags. And the literal translation for that word filthy rags. It's a little bit disgusting, but we're talking about how the scripture translate this. In the times in which they live, wasn't as sophisticated as we are now. And when a woman would have her menstrual cycle, they would literally get a rag and they would place it to catch everything. And when everything was drained, that is what Paul likened our righteousness as. Filthy rags. So none of us can say that we're righteous. None. Except my God God validate that in us. Because again, if it's up to me, I will stand in direct violation of scripture. And I'm going to do that which I seem right to me. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We look at the poor, we bat an eye, and we keep going. We are selective in what we do. Selective when it's convenient for me and when the crowd will see me doing what we perceive or feel is right i put everything in the moment and i dare say this to you just like you walk past the pool <sighs> god's spirit speak to you and say tend to the poor do this for the poor spend some time with the poor we are selective because there is no camera there to capture what I'm doing. And so that's why the Holy Spirit is asking us to question, are we the same person when the camera is on or when the camera is not on? Or do we modify and change who we are? Because I dare say this to you. Once God's Spirit speaks to you and tell you to do something, and if you decide not to do it, you are going to experience godly conviction if you are a child of God. And the only way you don't experience godly conviction, can I just take my time this morning? Can I take my time this morning? Let's go to Judges chapter number 16. Let's go to Judges chapter number 16 this morning. Judges chapter number 16. Talk about when we live a life that is not pleasing to God. And when we live this life and we do what we want to do. We minimize who God is in our life. But the scripture again says that I must decrease and he must increase in my life. Judges chapter number 16. Judges chapter number 16. When we live according to my God, our own righteousness and our own standing, it causes us to be ineffective ineffective and when we become ineffective we're no longer dependent god cannot depend on us excuse me to carry out the work that needs to be done judges chapter number 16 this is a story with samson mom 
Paul and created to be a deliverer. Bonjus was established around his life. Do not touch anything dead. Do not drink anything strong, my God, and do not cut your heel. And Samson lived based on how he wanted to live. He took everything that God set up, the boundaries, and he eroded the boundaries. So therefore, anything goes. And because anything goes in his life, and he called wrong, right, and right, wrong, this is, my God, the direction that we are headed towards if this, my God, are the conscious choices that we make. My God. Let me read from verse 15. Because I just want to read verse 20, but I want to read from 15. And it says now, so this is Samson laying in Delilah, Delilah's lap. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me, my God, where your great strength lies. And it came to pass that as she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her, all oh, my God, in his heart. And she said, no razor. And he said, right, and, uh, and all in his heart, and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I have shaven, then my strength will leave me, my God, and I will become weak, my God, and be like any other man. When Delilah saw, my God, that he told her everything that was in her heart, she sent, my God, and called the lords of the Philistine to come at once, for he had told her everything that was in his heart. So the Lord of the Philistine came up to her and brought her the money. Watch this. Then she lowered him to sleep on her knees and called for a man, my God, and shaved the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, my God, and his strength left him. But this is what I want to underscore and underline to us so that we have to understand, my God, that when God established standards and give it to us, it does not change for anything. Watch this. And she said unto him, the Philistine are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep, my God, and said, I will go out as before for other times and shake himself. This is the saddest passage of scripture. Watch this. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And when God's spirit and presence depart from us, we are now living with a form of godliness. It is no longer God's standard that dictate and determine what comes from us. There is no validation in this moment because God's spirit has left. Ah, Ichabod, yes, Jesus. Ah, yeah, 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 very thing. The God's spirit and his presence has left. Ah. And because his spirit and his presence has left. My God. Then the question is, whose standard are you living by? First Samuel chapter number four. I just feel like I want to preach as the Lord leads me this morning. Yeah. First Samuel chapter number four. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. First Samuel chapter number four. Yeah, Jesus. Verse twenty-one. Hmm. 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 Talk about the spirit of the Lord leaving. Ah, and when God's spirit leave, we are left to our own device 
and to do what we want to do. This is where, my God, this is where the danger is. This is the story of Eli. I feel, I feel God just taking a turn, so just be with me. And let's turn, let's lean into this with the Lord. Mom, this is the story of Eli. Ah, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And they did not live according to the established standard. Eli was the priest living a life that was pleasing to God, but his offspring decided to do things that was just deplorable and just wrong. And he never corrected them. And judgment came to his host. And when judgment came to his host, watch this. Ah. <laughs> Let's start at verse 15. Can I just take my time? I'm taking my time and I'm teaching this morning. Talk about the spirit of Almighty God leaving a place and leaving a person. And when this happened, good God, the Bible said that we open up ourselves, my God, for the enemy to run rampant in our lives. First Samuel chapter number four, let's start at verse 15. And it says, Eli was 99 years old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who comes, my God, from the battle. And my God, I fell today, my God, from the battle line. And he said, what, ha what happened, my son? So the messengers answered and said, Israel, my God, has fled before the Philistines. And they, my God, has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. The ark of God represents the presence of God. The presence of God, the ark of the covenant. That's where, my God, ah, they carried that and it was the presence of God. And they said, the ark is not captured. So the messenger answers, let me read that again, been captured, verse 18. And it says, then it happened, my God, when, my God, he mentioned that the ark of God had been captured. Eli, he fell off his seat backwards, my God, in the side of the gate. And his neck was broken and he died because he was heavy, he was old and heavy. And he said, my God, and he had judged Israel for 40 years. Watch this. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured, my God, and her father-in-law and her husband was dead, she bowed herself and gave birth for her labor pains came upon her. Watch the text. And about the time, my God, of her death, the woman stood by her, said to her, do not fear, my God, because you have bore a son. But she did not answered my God, nor she regarded it. Then she named the child Ichabod. Ichabod. And Ichabod means the glory has depart from Israel because the ark of God has been captured, my God, because her father-in-law and her husband and the, and she said the glory has departed from Israel, the ark of God has been captured. So when God's glory, his presence is not in your life, it is a type of Ichabod. God's presence is no longer there. And when God's presence is not in your life, anything goes. It is no longer God's standard established that you used to live out your life, but you are in a state and in a condition where anything goes. And when that is the reality, my God, that we have to navigate, how then do I conclude or say to myself that I'm a good person? Good by whose standard? Or good by what? Because again, my righteousness the best that I can do. Paul says it is as filthy, filthy rags. 
the best that I can do is as filthy rats, validated by the presence of God. Validated by the presence of God. Ah, validated. Ah, can I take my time? Question that the Lord wants to ask us this morning is simply this. Do you find that the thing that is consistent in your life or the inconsistent misrepresentation of who Christ is in your life? Do you have anyone in your inner circle that will hold you accountable for the errors of your week? The scripture explicitly states to us that we cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve God and money. The scripture says to us that it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And we see this with Dives, with, with Dives, because Dives, again, he was rich. And when we become rich, our focus, my God, is on our riches and what we can accumulate. And God is minimized. So God is no longer a priority to us. Now, am I saying that if the Lord bless you this morning, or has blessed you with riches and wealth that you should not take it. No, that's not what I'm saying. Because God blesses you so that you can be a blessing and a conduit to others to help them to understand that what God did for me, he can do it for you. But here is my question for you this morning. If riches and blessing will change you and cause you to lose your soul, my question to you is simply this. Do you still want to be rich and do you still want to be wealthy? That's what we have to ponder. This is at the heart of Luke chapter number 16. Again, I'll ask the question. If riches and blessing will cause you to lose your soul, do you still want to be rich? And do you still want to be wealthy? As a Christian believer, where we go from here, should be evaluated and determined by the will of God for our lives. Where we go, my God, should be dependent, my God, on fasting, prayer, reading the word and consulting God. That is what we do. Watch this. In other words, next step should be evaluated by God's standard is expectations and not our feelings and our emotion. Because my question to you is, what do you do? Or what have you done? What do you continue to do? Just like, like, like Samson. He lived a life that was not pleasing to God. Judges chapter number 16 and 20. It says that the spirit of Almighty God left him. And he did not know. Let's stay there for a moment. God's presence that resides in you. Whenever you have to deliberate over anything. You have inner conversation with the spirit and the presence of Almighty God. And you're telling me that God's presence left you and you do not know. So then my question is the inner conversation that you have, which is what you used to have with the Holy Spirit. Who then do you have that conversation with? And who then offer insight and suggestion as to what comes next in your life? A physical representation of what it looks like. When God, spirit leave is when the ark again was taken in the book of Samuel chapter number four. And this young lady realized it. And she said, this is Ichabod because God's presence is no left. And any time God's presence leave, we're in trouble. And this is where Dives was. The presence of the Lord did not contribute to any of his actions, his outlook, or anything that he set in motion in his life. He lived the way he felt, and he did what he wanted to do. Lazarus, on the other hand, poor but full of God's presence. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because there, my God, is the kingdom of heaven. So I would rather be poor in spirit 
in that I'm humble and I walk in humility than to be rich and wealthy without the presence of God and end up the way Dives end up. Mm. <laughs> Blessed be your name this morning, Jesus. Ah, I'm just trying to see what the Lord wants me to do up here. <laughs> Ah, blessed be your name, sweet Jesus. Hmm. Dives lived and his presentation of who he is. Dives lived with what the scripture called a form of godliness. In other words, he was a counterfeit. The Greeks had two understanding for the word form. You think about something that is physically formed. Let me grab this. This is physically formed. You have to touch it and you have to put it, my God, on the potter's wheel and you spin and you shape and you form this. So that's one understanding that the Greeks had. The second had to do with ideas and ideals that we form in our mind. And the ideas and the thoughts that we form, it can lead us to God or it can lead us away from God. I'll say that again for somebody. The ideas and the ideal. So when the scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. In other words, the mind of God has to be formed based on scripture. And the mind of God is not formed outside of scripture, because the Bible says that this contains the mind of God. So if we want to know what is in God's mind, we have to read this, and then we come into alignment. The language sounds familiar. So when we're having inner conversation, and the inner conversation that we have does not align with scripture, what David says, in that David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. In other words, what David is saying, ah, I have copied your word and it's in my heart. So when the opportunity presents itself for me to make choices, I no longer sit there by myself and come up with a determination based on ideas and ideals that I have formed independent of the word of God. David is now saying, thy word have I hid in my heart. In other words, David is saying, the word of God has a seat at the table of my heart and the word of God gets to deliberate and to put my God, its input into any outcome that I am going to do. And devoid of this, which is where Dives was, did not have the word of God for him to experience godly conviction to change and to stop living in and with this form of godliness. Because the Bible said that when we live with a form of godliness, we deny the power thereof. There is no power in us because of the pretense we can Put on God, we can look deep and wonderful, but just like Jesus convicted the Pharisees where he says, you, my God, you dress up the outside, but on the inside, you're like dead man's bone. You stink on the inside. There is nothing on the inside, my God, that will confirm or align, my God, that you're with me or off me. And Lazarus, live a life that was pleasing. Dives, dressed because he was rich, clothed and he could make himself look good, present himself well, but on the inside, he was so far from God, so far from the Lord, so much so that the Bible said again that they both died. And when they died, because of the choice that they made in this life, one spend eternity with God and the other spend eternity away from God. 
my question to you is this. Where will you spend eternity? Where? Can I just read one more passage of scripture while you ponder that question? Where will you spend eternity? Let me go back here. There is one more thing that I need to share with you. Where will you spend eternity? I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Where will you spend eternity? Will you spend it with God? <clears throat> or will you spend it away from God? <clears throat> will you spend it with God? Or will you spend it away from God? Because like I say to us, if it's one thing that every man will experience in this life after we die. We will all have an opportunity to stand, to sit, to roll, whatever we want to do when we get to the judgment seat of Christ. But every single one of us will have an opportunity to stand by God before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And you know what? We're going to have to give an account for everything that we did in this life. Everything that we say, everything that we did, and everything that we think. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter number five. That, I feel like I just want to read all of this. I came this morning just to read the verb to you, and that's what I'm going to do. Not with my words, but with his. Second Corinthians chapter number five. And it reads thus, it says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house that is not made of hands, my God, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but uh, for the clue, that morality, my God, may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared for us this thing is God, who also has given us, my God, the spirit as a guarantee. So we have God's spirit and God's spirit helps me to know and understand that yes, I'm on the right way. Why? Because I experience godly conviction. And without the spirit of almighty God residing in your life and mine, there is no way we can really and truly measure who we are, where we are, and if we're on the right path. So verse six, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home, in the body, my God, we are absent from the Lord. Watch this, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well, we are confident, yes, well, please rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it we make it our aim, we make it our aim, whether presence or absence, my God, to please him. Watch this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive, my God, the thing done in this body according to that which is done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror, my God, of the Lord, we, we persuade man, but we who are well known of God, and I also trust we are well known, my God, in our conscience, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but my God, watch this, give you, give you an opportunity to boast, my God, on your behalf, that we may have an answer, my God, for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are able of ourselves 
it is for God. Or if we, my God, are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that, my God, if one died for all, then all died. Watch this in 15. And he died for all, my God, that we may live, that we, that we, um, that those who rather live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, no, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though, my God, we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet no, we know him thus no longer. Therefore, watch it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. There is absolutely no way that I can live this Christian life without being validated by the Spirit and the power of Almighty God. Because if God's spirit does not reside in me, or my God, the area that I live in, again, what we read in the book of Samuel, Ichabod, the spirit and the presence of Almighty God is no longer there. And it's a dangerous place to be. And if you think not, look again as to what, my God, we read in the book of Judges where God's spirit left Samson and he did not know. So if God's spirit is nowhere around you, how then are in you? How then can I really and truly say that I'm a good person? Again, the question we have to ponder is simply this. Good by what standard or whose standard? Because ultimately, we're living a life that is pleasing to God. It is the spirit of Almighty God that lives in me, that convicts me. So when I see the poor and I bat an eye and I want to go and to turn, when I turn in this direction and I want to move, there's a passage of scripture that comes to my mind that says, be very careful of the persons that you interact with throughout your day to day. And I'm paraphrasing. Because chances are you will entertain angels unaware. My question to you is this. If you are walking down the street and this is the attitude that we have, we see somebody that looks poor and we look and we roll our eyes and we keep going throughout our day, we get to the end of our day where we sit to pray and when you sit to pray, the Lord taps you on your shoulder and say, hey, why did you turn away from me today? And he said, God, what do you mean? And he said, I came to visit you, but I came in the form of a poor individual. You saw me and you turned and you went the other way. This is the same thing that the Lord said to these Pharisees. When they asked him, they're talking about their righteousness. When did I see you? The Lord said, I came and I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you did not give me anything. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was in want and in need. But again, based on the standard of your righteousness and you saying that you're good, you look at me, you overlook me, my God, and you kept going. Your heart is not in the right place. Father, we come before you this morning, my God. We are truly, truly, truly great. Grateful, oh God, for all that you have done, all that you do, and all that you continue to do. Spirit of the living God, we come again looking at the lens of Luke chapter number 16, the story of Lazarus and Dives. One was rich, one was poor. My God, they live in the same community. They would have heard the same thing. Ah, custom norms were the same. But what was different, God, is that one decided to serve you in spirit and in truth, and one decided to live in, my God, his own righteousness, or what he perceived to be his own righteousness. God both died, but the outcome, my God, 
may have been shocking when the report came back. One, because the one that they believe would have spent eternity with you was now tormented. And the one that they thought, my God, because he was poor, my God would have ended up in, my God, that place of torment was spending eternity with you. And again, God, this has to do with the standard, my God, and the righteousness that we have concluded, my God, is righteous. We have our own standard. But again, you remind us, my God, of when you wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, come and ask you the question, God, will you destroy it for the sake of 50 righteous? And God, you said to him, go, here is my standard. It does not change. If you can find 50 men and women that fit the standard, I will save Sodom and Gomorrah. He went, look for 50, went, look for 40, went, look for 30, went, look for 20, went, look for 10, and he could not find any. And so we come and we're asking you, Lord God, let us spend some time with you, Lord God, so you can validate who we are. And once you validate who we are and let us know who we are in you, then, my God, we can take that which you have done in our lives and we can share that with others. God, we're not selective in our responses and the opportunity that you present. But whatever you tell us to do, God, we're going to do it wholeheartedly. Spirit of the living God, you just wanted to have a quiet conversation with us this morning. You wanted to teach us. You wanted to show us in your word. My God, that it's a dangerous place when your spirit leaves. Because who then guide us into all truth? Your word says, God, that when the spirit of Almighty God is come, he will lead us into all truth. So if the spirit of Almighty God has left me as a person, left my house and left my community, then the question is, who then guides and what is that truth? And so we pray and ask you this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to do some introspection. When we look within, do we then see you and feel your presence? Or are we in a place, my God, where is Ichabod? We look around and you're nowhere to be found. Maybe like Samson this morning, we rise from our sleep and our slumber and we're shaking as he often do. But when we shake and we expect a certain response, we're not feeling you. And what do we do, God? Now I understand why you say to us, don't give up and don't quit. Get up because you're going to touch us again. Touch us again one more time. So your spirit, your power, and your presence my God can be my God. Ah, that which makes the difference in our lives. We thank you for what you have done and we thank you for what you do. Father, we look to you this morning and we say thank you in Jesus' name. God bless you and thank you. Again, validated by God's spirit. It is not your righteousness nor mine because again, your righteousness and mine is as filthy rags. There is no standard that we can come up with the best of who we are. Still cannot match up. It is God who validates who you are and who I am. We have to live a life that is pleasing to God. Two individual, one rich, one poor. And I'm not saying that it's a bad thing for you to be rich. God has blessed you so you can be a blessing to others. And when money becomes the object and we lose sight of God, it's possible that we can live, my God, the way Dives live and end up where Dives end up. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. And may the peace of Almighty God, which pass it all understand, may it rest, remain, and abide with you from this day forward. God bless you.